I'm pushing this through, Minister, with or without you. And as you can hear, the upper city is um, where kind of the ruling body of, of Divinity's Reach uh, resides. We have the Queen's Palace up here. We have the Ministry, um, who are our politicians and our lawmakers, and you can often hear them talking about politics and local affairs, that sort of thing. Um, and I wanted to... Uh, come up here to get, again talk about our art a little bit. So uh, Guild Wars 2 uh, is not a game that relies on a lot of technology and big system requirements to look good. We rely on um, the skill of our artists and in giving them the freedom to kind of imagine really fantastic things. Um, you know, we know that uh, a big reason why people play MMOs is to see things that they can't see in normal life to, um, you know, kind of get away from things. Uh, kind of get away from that normal um, you know, day to day. And so we allow our, our artists to kind of uh, create these really fantastical vistas um, and so like this for example is a you know this beautiful garden with its uh, clockwork constellations above it you know kind of moving is an example of the sort of uh, thing that we want to put a lot of all over the game which are really memorable locations that are that are really pretty to look at and uh, and are very unique to our world <clears throat> so now we'll um, kind of continue on um, we'll go to, actually, let's open up the map and take a look at the city. Um, oh, it was still a little fogged out, so we'll have to uh, unfog things. There we go. So uh, this is our city. You can see the uh, trail we took to get to where we are. Um, so this whole thing is one big um, uh, persistent uh, city, uh, with one exception, which is this area right here, which you can see is marked home. This area is our home district. It's an instanced area where um, things that you do in your story are reflected. So, uh, for example, uh, I might have the chance to uh, decide whether a certain character lives or dies. If I let them die, not only is it maybe going to change uh, kind of the narrative structure, but that character is no longer going to be located in my home area. Um, if I let them live, then they'll be there and I get to, you know, talk to them uh, later on, that sort of thing. Uh, certain buildings can get destroyed. You'll have a chance to save them. Uh, a lot of different changes kind of come over our home district here. Um, so you'll notice we're going to teleport over there and we're going to use our waypoint system, which is our fast travel system. So our fast travel system is um, kind of an extension of the system that we had in Guild Wars 1. In Guild Wars 1 we had a system called map travel um, and we've kind of taken that and made it happen in the persistent world. You can see all these waypoints all over. Um, we have them all unlocked for the purposes of the demo so we can move around. But through normal gameplay, what would happen is you would go out and you would explore and you'd find a waypoint, you'd unlock it, and then you could click to it to teleport it uh, to it um, for uh, you know a small uh, gold fee, and you could teleport there instantly. Um, and so one of the things we want to try to do with this system is to really make it so that it's not a pain in the butt for players to um, play with their friends. They can get to places they want to go to easily. We don't want to force that kind of running through the world for onto players who don't really enjoy that sort of thing. Um, for players who do enjoy kind of traveling by foot and looking at the sites and all that, they're free to continue to do that. So we'll enter our uh, instance. Um, so one of the things that we've talked about is kind of how different the branching stories are. Um, and this is one of the first places where you'd really feel that. So um, if we had chosen that we were a noble, um, I talked about our, our friend Lord Farron, who's kind of a, a, a character. He would have uh, chosen to throw us uh, this kind of grand party with all these other nobles. And we would have come into this area and you would have seen, you know, the place is all decorated. There's, uh, you know, people drinking and dancing and entertainers and all that sort of thing. Um, had we chosen to be from the streets, we would go to our little alleyway where we live and we would have found that our friend Quinn, um, who uh, belongs to a gang that we we also used to belong to, is in trouble with that gang and needs our help. Keep walking. Um, you ain't a friend of Big Nose Ted. In this particular case, um, what we have is the no, no, inn that's no, no, owned no, by no, our no, friends no, Andrew no, and Petra, no, and we find that there are some uh, ruffians here causing problems. Hey, watch it! You almost spilled my drink, and I almost had to mop it up with your face. I need to start bringing a big dog to work. So, uh, Petra has the uh, uh, starburst over her head, which indicates that you can continue your personal story by talking to her. Um, for the demo, we're going to stop right here um, for the human section, and we're going to uh, go play a char character and see what that's like. So, for our char character, 
Um, we're going to play um, a character that's in their high 40s. Um, the level cap is 80, so that's kind of a high to mid-range kind of character. Um, but not totally at the level cap. Um, he'll have all his skills unlocked, so you'll get to see what it looks like um, to have a full skill bar. Um, again, the Char are, were our antagonists in Guild Wars 1. They're kind of a bestial feline race, but at the same time, they're the most technologically advanced race in our world. So that's kind of an interesting twist that they have. Um, you can see our Char there. Um, he's a warrior, um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about our versatility of our professions. So we saw the Elementalist, and we saw how he was versatile by changing uh, attunements. Um, an Elementalist has four different attunements to choose from. Um, and you'll see um, kind of our philosophy with our characters is we don't want anything that our, our characters can do to be, to feel like it's kind of secondary, like it's not effective. In most games, you have a warrior, you grab a bow. Uh, that bow is only used as kind of a, a tool for pulling or something like that. It's not really a damage dealing weapon. And in our game, uh, a warrior with a bow can really deal some good damage. There's a player actually in a golem battle suit, um, so we'll, we'll kind of get away from him there. And uh, you'll see, for example, our, uh, our char warrior is able to inflict heavy AoE damage with his bow. Um, and so he can take on kind of that range damage role. Um, changing roles is really simple. He can have another weapon set equipped, and he can change his weapons, and then you see his first five skills change. Now he's got two axes equipped, and he's kind of a melee damage dealer now at this point. Um, if he wanted to, he could equip a mason shield um, to become a uh, sort of more defensive character. Um, he could, instead of having a shield, equip a... Uh, equip a Warhorn, which would make him a uh, sort of more support character. Um, and so uh, you can change kind of your, uh, your role on the battlefield uh, very, very easily. And this is something that we, we want to emphasize. Um, we want to make it so that you don't have to have any particular profession in order to play the game. We don't want you to stand around waiting for you know, a half hour, waiting for that one healer to come along. We don't want you to have to play a healer because you know the group you play with, none of them want to play a healer. So I guess you're going to kind of bite the bullet and play one even though you don't think it's that fun. Um, we don't want you to have to play with that kind of guy who you really don't want to play with except for he's a healer and he's kind of always around and you kind of need a healer so you're willing to, to kind of play with him. Uh, we don't want you to have to do that. We want you to be able to play with whoever you want to play with. Play with your friends, uh, you know, play with the people that you enjoy playing with. That's sort of our philosophy. Um, and so we're actually communicating with the people at ArenaNet right now. Um, we're trying to find out where some events are going on. You can see um, lots of things to do, lots of places to visit. Uh, so we're going to head down to Dragon Watch, which is um, a small char town. Okay, so this event isn't running. Uh, so we're actually going to uh, head down to a fortress called Steel Eye Span. So um, one of these areas, uh, this area is kind of the area that you remember from uh, Guild Wars 1, um, the Ascalon area, where um, you know the Char summoned all these crystals down and uh, made the place all um, you know, burnt out and kind of post-apocalyptic. And now it's recovered, except for the fact that uh, the one of the Elder Dragons flew over it and kind of just him flying over it and casting his shadow warped and twisted and corrupted this big swath of the land. And the Char have built this massive fortress over the southern end of it called Steel Eye Span. And Steel Eye Span is kind of constantly under assault from the minions of the dragon. So we've actually seen uh, the minions are attacking now. And so uh, we've got an event. Again, we came in kind of in the middle of the event. You can see one of the wall sections appears to maybe have just gotten destroyed. Um, uh, we're helping to defend Steel Eye Span's walls. Okay, so actually I think that event just uh, just failed and now uh, the minions have broken in and we have to defend the uh, Tribune here, who's the leader of this fortress. If we fail here, what'll happen is the minions will take over the fortress and then it'll, it'll have an event here to drive the minions out. Um, one thing to note, our uh, event system is uh, what we like to call persistent. It doesn't mean that there are permanent changes in the world. Okay. It doesn't mean there are permanent changes in the world. Um, so 
this fortress, once it's destroyed, will not stay destroyed forever, but it will stay taken over until players come and change what's going on. So it has persistence to it. Yeah, we're running out of time, Matthew. Is the uh, the other event? Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, so we actually have uh, an event that's usually at the end of uh, kind of this uh, long uh, event chain. Um, but for the show, we wanted everybody to be able to see it. So we've um, kind of made it happen at sort of irregular intervals. Um, and we give everybody the opportunity to teleport to it. So this is the confrontation with the Shatterer, which is um, one of the minions of the Elder Dragon that caused all of this destruction. So again, one thing to note, um, you know, this is the sort of boss fight that you would normally see, um, you know, hidden away in a dungeon somewhere, um, something like that. Uh, Matthew, why don't you go man some turrets or something like that, and we can see how that works. So uh, in our game, we want these encounters, these like big epic encounters, to be for all players to be able to participate in, and this is an event. So. Um, you know, it will scale um, as, as our bosses um, have more players fighting against them. They start getting new abilities that allow them to cope with greater number of players. There are probably looks like you know 30 to 40 players in this fight, um, and they're all going to get credit for participating if they participate in the fight. We built a lot of uh, avenues of teamwork into the game. So, uh, for example, all of these cannons and mortars, um, there are minions that get created by the Shatterer. If uh, the Shatterer lets, uh, if the players let those minions get to the back line, then they can destroy the mortars and cannons, and then the players won't be able to use them. In addition to that, if the cannons get destroyed, it'll kick off an event where a supply train tries to come up to this area from a, a fortress to the south. And if they uh, don't succeed, if players aren't able to get that supply train in here, then they can't fix the cannons, and the cannons won't be available in the attack. So that's a good way, um, a good example of one event influencing another. So Matthew's summoning his uh, war banner, which is his elite skill. Um, and you'll notice he's healing characters in the area of the banner. Uh, once again, versatility of our profession. Since he chose to bring a support skill in his elite slot, he can now help out players around him. See the Shatter is almost defeated here. See him again reviving another player. Notice this player is not completely down. They're still able to fight from a down state. Okay, so uh, that was our, uh, our uh, encounter with the Shatterer. Now he also drops a big giant chest. Hey everybody, thank you so much for uh, watching our demo and we really look forward to seeing you in game.